Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. Now to your host, Ken Jakes. Hi, everyone. This is Ken Jakes. I'm the host of Democracy That Delivers, our podcast here at SITE. And I'm joined direct from Singapore this morning and in the evening. His time, his name is Richard Daly. He is the Managing Director in the Business Intelligent Investigations Practice of Kroll, a division of Duff and Phelps. And he is based in Singapore. And I take it by your accent, you're British, Richard? I am. That's true, Ken. Yes. Uh, good to speak yeah. to you. And uh, I hope you can understand my uh, my accent. Uh, I do. I don't, I don't need a translator, right? All right. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> How long have you been in Singapore? Okay, so I, I came to Singapore about eight years ago, eight or nine years ago. And before that, I had been with Kroll in Mumbai. In fact, I set up Kroll's office in Mumbai. So I okay. transferred directly from there to Singapore I'm in about 2012. Oh, okay. And, yeah. uh, and you're a managing director for business intelligence and investigations. So tell me what that's that right. Yeah. So fundamentally, we, we provide clients with fairly high level intelligence, business intelligence to help them make decisions. Now, normally, Normally, that fits into three broad brackets, which might be intelligence ahead of, a, of an investment or a major a major transaction, which you you know you could you could see that as part of the due diligence process. It could be intelligence as part of um, a dispute, uh, usually an international dispute, where we might work with a with a major law firm, or also we provide uh, information and uh, additional intelligence in support of internal investigations. So it's the same kinds of skill set. It's a fairly sophisticated and advanced research methodology online, and then obviously. That I guess the core really is providing is adding to that with primary sources on the ground, and that provides clients with a um, you know a good all round understanding of the issues, which is uh, beyond what you're able to Google. <laughs> that's uh, I guess that's the point really. So it's you know it's and, and obviously we we have um, our own kind of quality control to make sure that what we're doing is uh, accurate and helpful to the clients. So pretty high end, bespoke, and tailored very much towards the business problems which our clients have. Okay, what we want to talk about in this next half hour so is sure. supply chains, which is at the top of the news uh, once yep. again with, with COVID. It's become a very, very big factor in, yep. in the whole mess that we see around the world. Yep. But before we get started and, and, yep. and before we kind of segue into the COVID crisis, let's talk a little bit about supply chains in what some would call even a crisis in supply sure. chain, supply chain management around the world, because there's been criticism that there's very few suppliers coming from a handful of sources and it needs to be diversified. And in fact, we talked to one of your colleagues recently who is on our board, Nicole, yep. and, we, and we talked about that on, on a global sphere. But I wanted to talk to you about you know how the supply chains, especially now and with COVID, has affected the APEC region. But again, before we get into that, I want to get your views on supply chains and, and some of the difficulties that the world had leading up to the COVID crisis. Sure. I think one of the major issues, which I don't think is widely realized, most corporates don't really understand their own supply chains beneath about the second or third and what I mean by that is, is that most corporates are going to be relying on one or two major suppliers, often in foreign countries. So that might be an American corporate with suppliers in somewhere in the in the Asian region. But who they subcontract to, they might well know. They might well know. But who those subcontractors subcontract to, that's when things start to get very murky. And I've certainly been on calls with major corporates, even not necessarily Western corporates, but other major global corporates who've told me they've had supply chains which they know are 12 deep. So these are suppliers, subcontracting to suppliers, subcontracting to suppliers, and you can see how it goes. So so understanding who is at the end of those chains is really almost unknown to pretty much anyone. And certainly, I would suggest that even those corporates at the top of the supply chains don't really know where ultimately the raw materials actually come from for some of the products or, or services that they're offering. And that's not really widely acknowledged. I think when people talk about supply chains, even when corporates talk about supply chains, they only really like to talk about that first one or two tier, uh, the first one or two tiers. So one of the issues that we had been looking at recently, if I can continue, Ken, was exactly this, in fact, and was the fact that many corporates would hire very competent audit firms to look at those first one or two tiers. But of course, these kind of audits are overt. They are done with the knowledge of everybody involved. And if there are uh, contractors or subcontractors or subcontractors of subcontractors, which those companies would rather 
keep quiet from the the um, the ultimate client, then it's very easy for them to disguise that. And this is exactly how issues such as human trafficking and modern slavery are made use of within supply chains, even within kind of global brands. Because, you know, quite honestly, many, many companies don't really know how deep and how opaque those supply chains actually get. Well, one thing that just pops into my mind, and we talk about corruption a lot at Hype, and I'm sure you deal with it a lot yeah. as well. But the deeper the supply chains, the more likely the incidents of corruption could occur and with the corporates at, at the top really not knowing what's going on. And this really could cause a company a lot of problems, especially with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and so on and so forth. Absolutely right. I mean, the general counsels and, and risk professionals and compliance professionals, they, you know, they do a good job at looking at that first one or two tier, but they can't. This information is being withheld from them. So they can't know who are the suppliers of the suppliers of the suppliers. And you're quite right. It's um, It becomes very difficult to start to evaluate where those risks start to come in. FCPA is a problem. You're quite right. That suggests bribery of foreign officials, which within supply chains is less of a problem. But certainly there is legislation around the world, most notably in the UK with the Modern Slavery Act, which has been replicated in, in Australia recently. So the human trafficking aspect of this really becomes a problem. That's exactly right. But unfortunately, even most of these pieces of, leg- of legislation don't have the, the financial sanction that perhaps the, the FCPA or other anti-bribery and corruption legislation has. So, you know, disappointingly, the both the UK and the Australian Modern Slavery Acts don't have that kind of financial impetus that perhaps exists with more traditional or older anti-corruption legislation. So the only real damage, to be totally to be totally frank about this, the only real damage that a company or a corporate might suffer is a reputational damage. Now, that can be severe. And you're probably aware that there have been some sports manufacturers who have been addressing this, some of them very successfully. Yes. But it, it does affect the brand. Uh, coffees, are, I can think of coffee suppliers. I, I, I know many uh, kind of disposable fashion brands who, who've been caught up in this over the years. But it doesn't still, at the end of the day, it's not treated with the same level of seriousness, perhaps, as uh, other aspects of corruption. I mean, I would consider it to be equally, equally important. If I can dive, uh, just go on slightly, I mean, what yeah. brought us into this, Ken, was, you might recall in 2013, a building in Bangladesh collapsed called the Rana Plaza building. And uh, I think it was, um, it was over, th- over a thousand, I think it was 1,100 people were, were killed in that disaster. And what was striking was that pretty much all of the companies that had elements of its supply chain within that building were, were well-known Western brands. And our thinking was, well, we are regularly brought on board to undertake due diligence work and, and business intelligence work ahead of a transaction because understanding who your partners are in that context is extremely important because, of course, there's there's all the regulatory issues around foreign corrupt practices, like, for instance, and other, other elements of, uh, of corruption. But when it comes to supply chains, it's something which is more or has been more brushed under the carpet. And it's it's disappointing. I, I mean, I actually think that until before the COVID crisis emerged, I think that the world was moving that way. I mean, ESG has become a real buzzword, you know, amongst the kind of investment community. And people are much more concerned now about issues relating to ethics of business than they were perhaps three or four years ago. In many respects, in 2013, 2012, when we as Scroll started to look at these issues, we were slightly ahead of the curve. But um, I'm glad to say that the, the world, well, it had caught up. But unfortunately, I think COVID might have a, a detrimental effect on, on some of those positive impacts. Well, that, that's a perfect segue into COVID. How has COVID amplified these problems, exacerbated? What are some, some of the key issues that we see that has kind of come out of the COVID crisis with supply chains? Right. Well, obviously, it's an evolving situation. And obviously, any kind of, I mean, what we're doing here in many respects is kind of engaging in a sort of um, political risk game, which is, um, you know, it can be a bit like reading tea leaves. So we are, you know, we're we are kind of making some assumptions here. And we may be just in the just the very beginning of this too. Oh, totally. I mean, I think things are evolving in, uh, every day. I mean, and going in different directions every day. You know, I think historically, most corporates, I mean, and let's talk about Western corporates. I mean, I, I obviously, I, you know, I don't want to name names or anything, but most Western corporates, I think, have been driven in the past pu- really purely by, by, by cost and margin uh, because of the low cost of labor, particularly in Asia. Um, and then, as we were saying, in recent times, that's that started to change uh, with more of an emphasis on compliance and ethics, which was a good change. Um, I think the I think the general theme that we are going to see moving forward is that supply chains are going to become more politicized, and I think there are going to be many ways in which that shows itself. But it will, unfortunately, I think it it will move the narrative away from the ethics and compliance 
story, which we were just saying was actually quite a positive story. And I think it, it will become the, together with cost and, and margin, will become the two driving factors, I think, which will uh, determine where corporates going forward will choose to put their supply chains and which countries they'll, they'll, they'll choose to work, work in. I'm sure you're aware that many nations are already looking at bringing home supply chains where they can. And, and like Japan, for one, is doing it. France, for one, is, uh, is doing it. This is going to become, I think, um, you know, a feature. But it's not always going to be possible. So there will still be international global supply chains out there. But how, where they are, I think, is going to be determined on a slightly different basis than it had been in the past. Let's talk a little bit about how exposed some of these supply chains are because of the corona crisis. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, exposed in terms of, can you give me some, what you really mean by exposed? Well, just how fragile they are well, right now. Well, yeah. I mean, I was quite astonished when I heard that, for instance, the U.S. doesn't have its own domestic production of, of penicillin. I thought that was, I was quite surprised. It's so I think, I, pardon, yeah, you, yeah, you were surprised. It was extraordinary. And, and yeah. it hadn't ever really occurred to me, to be honest with you. That, that, well, you'd think there'd be a stockpile of it. In the, well, exactly. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and you would have thought really as part of the current defense industry in many respects that you would you would have right. that. So that was a, a real surprise to me personally. And I, I suspect that there are many issues like that in other, in other areas. So, and I'm thinking perhaps of, you know, rare minerals, which perhaps aren't so easily available in Western countries. There's always going to be that element of fragility, if you like. I think that the big difference going forward is that there's going to be an additional element of risk, I think, because of the politics, which I think is likely to emerge from the COVID crisis and the way and that the the business and politics are likely to become more intertwined, I think, moving forward. So yes, I mean, in many respects, they have always been fragile, but that I think could become more exacerbated. How does this affect globalization? And I think this gets to your point about politics and, and bringing uh, politics into this whole equation. Are countries starting to look more inward now and less uh, in terms of globalization? Is this being driven uh, domestically at home? I mean, we, we've seen this in the United States with, with the trade wars uh, going on or kind of politics of, I, I don't want to say nationalism, but, yeah. but you know, trying to keep things at home. And you see movements across the world from authoritarian or, or countries moving in, in more of an authoritarian yep. uh, way, like in Orban in Hungary and different yes, places. Exactly. Like Do you see it that way? Is that what you're really getting at when you're talking about uh, how all of this is being politicized or can be politicized? Yes, I am. But but I mean, globalization, let's not forget, has been around a long time and it's been in, around yeah. various various forms for, you know, two or three hundred, three or four hundred years. We have been, I think, in the you know late 20th century at the kind of the very top of 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 we got as far as we can go, I think, in terms of globalization. And in many respects, it went too far. Can you talk more about that? That's very interesting that you think this, we, we've kind of gone as far as we go with it. Well, I mean, I think that the natural corollary of how far we had gone was a backlash. And that was already okay. happening. I mean, yes. I think that was already happening. I think we saw that with various uh, elections in the West, in the US, the Brexit debate in the UK. You mentioned Oban in Hungary. We've seen the same thing in France, um, across the world. I mean, even in Asia, I mean, I, I do a lot of work in Thailand. And, and, you know, that has become much more protectionist than it has been in the past. And I think that that move towards, if you like, a different kind of sovereignty, of pulling back sovereignty from a world which had been perceived, particularly by, the, by, let's say, the working class, you know, blue collar workers, it had gone too far, are kind of pulling back from that. I mean, um, you know, I, I'm very conscious sometimes that, you know, I'm sort of perceived as the international global elite, I, I suspect, and, and, and any of us who, who move around countries you know, on, on a weekly basis. And I suspect you know, we are seen as that in many respects. But And I think there's definitely pulling back from that. And that's been very obvious, I think, in the elections in the West over the last three or four years. I think the COVID crisis is going to exacerbate that. And I think that there'll be, a rather than a, a pull back towards protectionism and sovereignty, perhaps we'll see more of a fracturing along more about cultural and perhaps language lines. So perhaps we'll see. There's been a lot of talk over the years about what they call the Anglosphere. So this has been, you know, the primarily sort of British colonial nations and other nations that, that were English speaking about being, you know, going back to that, which had, you know, really been part of the um, Commonwealth, if you like. And I think we might see the same kind of division with Confucian nations and, and other, other nations who feel a sense of a comfort, if you like, in dealing with, with people who they perceive to be friendly. I think there are going to be different criteria and very loose and, subje- and subjective criteria about how you deem who is friendly. But I think that could be a way in which the world fractures moving forward. So not necessarily down the straight, you know, nationalistic sovereignty lines that perhaps we were seeing until COVID, but more down the lines of, you know, I can trust these guys because they were, in the case of the UK, for instance, they 
of a former colonist of the UK or France or or any other former colonial nation. Or in the case of the States, well, you know, we've had a lot of um, a great relationship with the Philippines historically. So, you know, we're quite happy having our uh, supply chains based in the Philippines, but, you know, perhaps less so Vietnam because, you know, some history there, despite the fact that, in fact, these countries have changed. So I think we might see some fracturing along those lines going into the into the into the future. I think an interesting outlier here is going to be the the um, a tension between India and China. I was going to I was going to ask about that. India has a lot. Of, I mean, I, no, I've worked in India. I know it very well. India has a lot in common with with the West, and you know, English is very widely spoken. Not as widely spoken as some people think, but it's it's very widely spoken. Right, right. It's the language of business, and you could certainly see a scenario where India benefits from a fracturing, perhaps, of the relationship with China and another Confucian leaning nations, for want of a. Is that because of uh, low labor costs? Is that because of low labor costs? Well, low labor costs has been, been part of it. Yeah, one of the reasons why countries might want to, you know, position their supply chains in India. But I can certainly see India being a beneficiary. The problem in India has always been that doing business there is so difficult because of the bureaucracy, red tape, and because of that, it, it does have a specific, very real problem with corruption. Uh, and you know, and that's known. <laughs> so that does put off a lot of corporates from from investing in India or positioning their supply chains there. But I think if India can, can address this problem, and if it's a big if, then I think it has a, a great opportunity to to really be able to become that that next powerhouse. But you know, going back to the original point, I think yes, the, the globalization is definitely changing, but it's it's always changed and evolved over the last the last three or four hundred years. I think we're going to see more of a, a division of countries along along the lines of who they feel comfortable dealing with, along languages and, and other cultural aspects that are perhaps quite soft and quite you know quite difficult to define. And it's going to be a question, I think, of where people feel the risk is less and where they feel they understand the politics of a country. That's going to become very important, I think, moving forward. So when the uh, COVID crisis started, obviously it started in China and they shut down, which affected the supply chains to the rest of the world, especially here in the States. What do you see as a response to that by companies and, and governments, just not the U.S. government, but other governments? Do, do you see companies starting to look inward and and looking at uh, domestic supply chains rather than looking abroad? How do you see this evolving? Yeah, I mean, where they can, I think, in certain sectors, there is going to be a drive towards, you know, localizing supply chains. Agriculture might be one particular example where that might work quite well. And don't forget, of course, this is also going to be, there's going to be a motivation here. There's going to be a driver here because, of course, many Western countries, all Western countries, are going to be hit by the economic effects of, of, of COVID. So not only are we looking at re-evaluating supply chains, but there's going to be um, an economic benefit in creating jobs at home as well, and, and a political benefit in creating jobs at home as well. So there's, a, there's, there's many elements, I think, to this. So yes, I think where it's possible to position supply chains at home, and in particular, the Japanese and, and French are looking at this, and obviously, uh, I know they are in the States as well, that's going to happen. But there are certain industries that's just not possible. So you know, where, where uh, significant human low-cost labor is required, then there is still going to be a requirement for countries to position supply chains offshore. But whether they'll want to be in China, or whether they'll want to be in a country which is now going to be deemed as a high-risk country is the question. And um, how you define find those risks, I think, is going to become the interesting question. And I think there's going to be lots of elements which feed into how corporates and and their governments perceive those risks and how they're defined. So yes, they will localise where they can, but it's not always going to be possible. It's, it's just not. And of course, the consumer is going to have less money. So, you know, corporates are going to have um, a lot of pressure on them to keep to keep prices down. And that can only really be done by having, you know, by having the supply chains and cost of labour issues overseas. That's still going to be a major, you know, a major factor in this. Well, Richard, as a and I was just looking over the notes that you sent me, which were fantastic, by the way. And this this is really kind of a perfect segue into what you were talking about. But can you elaborate on how corporations might in the future view a country as being friendly versus unfriendly? <laughs> an evolving, <laughs> an evolving exactly. um, uh, um, uh, uh, thinking of my own, if you well, like. It, it's being accelerated, I think. Oh, because totally. Yes, totally. I mean, to give you some examples in Asia, because this is a part of the world I know well, I've been looking very much at the development of Myanmar. Um, and it's you know has been very exciting. It's been a bit lumpy in terms of the way things have moved forward. But nonetheless, until COVID, I think there was a good chance that Myanmar was going to become you know one of the the next nations in this region to benefit uh, from globalisation. But I wonder if that's the case now. Myanmar is still so opaque and the infrastructure is 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 poor that I wonder if a company which was considering putting some of its workforce into Myanmar is just going to go, you know, it's just not worth it. I think let's go to India instead because, you know, it's got some problems here, it's got some problems there, it's more expensive. But at the end of the day, it's going to be easier to navigate away around around India than Myanmar. So 
I think that there will be winners and there will be losers here. As I mentioned earlier on, I suspect language is going to be part of it. I suspect some kind of sense of shared history, be that real or not, (laughs) is going to be part of it. So, you know, the Philippines could still benefit from its historic relationship with the US. I think India, Malaysia will benefit from their historic relationship with the UK. Vietnam, Cambodia will, will benefit from their historic relationship with France. I suspect they will become drivers more than, because I think people will feel more at home in those countries. Who do you think the winners and losers will be uh, out of this? If you if you were to put a crystal, look at a crystal ball, say five years down the road, is, is it the Chinese? Or are they so heavily integrated down the global economy that that's going to be kind of hard for them to kind of suffer from this? I mean, I think in many respects, things are just going to rebalance. So, okay. I mean, Vietnam is a good example. I, I'm aware, for instance, that Vietnam has um, lost a lot of business from the West because of its timber business, which I think is used in in, um, in furniture making. So, obviously, the consumer uh, demand for that has gone through the floor in the West, and that's really hit. Apparently, I, I read that's really hit Vietnamese timber industry pretty badly. But I could see that, although, for instance, China and Vietnam have a fairly complicated historic relationship. I could see that perhaps it would be beneficial for those two countries to become more aligned, and uh, which would, you know, which would, if you like, take up the slack from the which Vietnam might have lost from the West. So, I think it will be a realignment rather than a. There will be initial winners and losers, but I think that will evolve over time. I mean, all of these things are going to change, obviously, over time. But so it's difficult to say that there will be ultimate winners. I mean, countries which really do have a problem with with development. So, but the countries which where, where where they still have significant challenges in terms of logistics and the regulatory environment. I mean, Myanmar is a good example. Laos, perhaps Papua New Guinea. You know, these are a long way behind the rest of Asia. Chance there was a real opportunity, I think, before COVID that these countries could have caught up very quickly. But I think I think this is going to delay things quite significantly. I mean. Why would you choose on putting your supply chain in Myanmar or Laos when, you know, you could go to Malaysia or Thailand where there is the rule of law and, you know, where there are established international banks operating quite quite happily and it, and the international law firms are all there? It just seems to me unlikely that you would take a gamble on a country which is less developed, which is tragic in many respects for those countries' development. But I think it will put them back. Has there been any governments or in this, we're running out of time, we got about a minute or so. Uh, any government or industry sectors or even companies that have reacted really, really well to the crisis and, and kind of pivoted in a very positive way that you can think of? It depends what you mean by a positive way. I mean, I heard announcements immediately from the U.S. We're not back, we're going back to the there is no penicillin in the U.S. discussion right. about having that supply chain, which is surely not that hard if you're talking about, you know, creating essentially a chemical manufacturing plant in the US. I wouldn't have thought, not, no expert on this, but but it would seem to me that that would be a relatively easy yeah. and relatively straightforward and something which the US, I would have thought, you know, would, would be already working on pretty much straight away. As I mentioned earlier on, I mean, the two, two, the two of the big kind of named countries who have said that they're going to look at repatriating their supply chains are Japan and France. But is that a positive thing? I'm not sure. I mean, in many respects, that... You're right. It's it's how you define the word. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, in many respects, that exacerbates the the protectionism and and, um, nationalism discussion, which we we skirted around earlier on. And maybe that's not something which we should be seeing as a positive trait. Maybe the positive way of approaching this is to be approaching this from a a global position. I mean, maybe I've heard, certainly heard the argument that COVID could have been dealt with much more efficiently had we approached it, really had the international community approached it as more of a joint project and rather than a an individual state run right. as individual state run projects. So you know the Chinese having their uh, response, the US having their response, individual European nations having their response. I think that in itself has demonstrated that the the downsides of challenges to globalization. And I would rather hope that that we don't see the kind of knee jerk responses in supply chains that we're suggesting. I just think that we will. I think it's just a, a reality of the situation. So um, it's more of a reaction than anything yeah. Else. I think it is. It'd be nice to think as part of the liberal elite. I think it would be nice to think that globalization would kind of pick up where it left off and and it's still going to benefit humanity. I'm not convinced that's the case. That's the problem. And I'm not convinced that retreating, you know, into a bunker or trying to localize everything is the way 
way forward. That said, of course, there are many benefits in doing it. There is obviously the counter argument that it had gone too far, and that, you know, for instance, things like carbon footprint have got out of control with overly complex supply chains. So, so it's a balance. Maybe it's time to address that balance. But any nation which has responded kind of rationally and sensibly, and I think it's too early to tell. At this point, it's too early to tell. The, I mean, we st- we're still in the throes of seeing how this is going to play out in terms of the numbers of casualties, for instance. So, like we talked um, about at the top of the show, it, it, this yeah. will probably be in the beginning stages of this. I suspect that's true. So, so I think it's too early to tell. Yeah, but I rather hope it's. I rather hope. I, I, my, my own view is that a globalized world is a safer world, and I rather hope that we don't go too far the other way. Right. Well, Richard, we're out of time. We've gone over. For me, this is one of the most interesting conversations I've had in a long time on the podcast. So I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. That's very kind. Thank you very much, Ken. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it. And um, apologies for the slight hiccup last week. So. <laughs> and if you, if you don't mind, would you uh, want to come back on in, in uh, two or three months and we can do a follow-up and just see how things got involved? And that'd be great. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, that'd be terrific. I'm very honored. Um, so thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Okay, thanks. And we'll see everybody next week. Okay, bye. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. 